Okay, let us continue then. First, there is a correction. I have been missing while talking to write the squares here in the definition of the Weierstrass p function. So please correct it. And the second statement, which was not correct, was that you can express any elliptic function as a rational function in p and p prime. So I said a polynomial, that's wrong. So it's, it's stronger the statement, you can do it as a rational function. We'll, we'll get across this property. Now, if you remember the uh, multiple zeta values and the integral definition of the multiple zeta values, you could get any of these multiple zeta values by iterate, iterated integration over a differential form of the form dt over t minus a. And the question I would like to ask and also answer in the second part is, what is the analog of this uh, differential? on genus one. So, does anybody have an idea what should be the, the right thing? So, what would we expect from an analog of a natural differential on, on genus one. We would think that should be better something which respects the symmetries of the surface we are considering. So this differential should, in some sense, be a doubly periodic function. What else would we expect? One would think, since maybe having the physics application in mind, that whenever I put zero in there, so whenever it, it's is a derivative of a propagator, then uh, it should better diverge as does this. And uh, then one can ask, is there a unique function which actually is at the same time dependent on the distance of two objects? So here we are measuring the inverse of a distance. So it's one over z1 minus z2. If you are calculating things in a conformal field theory or here in general it's one over t minus a1. So we want a notion of distance on the elliptic curve which respects the uh, two cycles of the elliptic curve. And one can show, and there is a nice paper by a colleague of mine, Nils Mattes, uh, just three years ago, that the following function is the unique solution or the unique answer to the question I have just been asking. So let us define the Kronecker function. Many people refer to it as the Eisenstein Kronecker function. Uh, other people call it the Kronecker Zagier function or Zagier Kronecker function. Uh, there is some dispute, so let's just stick to Kronecker function because Kronecker is in each of these. Uh, names contained. And the Kronecker function is defined as follows. It is f of xi, the second variable eta and tau. So it is again a function which uh, carries an argument uh, in which the geometry of the genus one surface under consideration is encrypted or encoded. So all the uh, values or all the functions we will be considering, including the elliptic multiple zeta values, which are supposed to be numbers bar, but are actually functions of tau, uh, will have this tau in the argument. And this is the ratio of the uh, Jacobi function uh, uh, the derivative of the de Jacobi function with respect to z at zero times uh, the Jacobi function of xi plus eta over Jacobi function of xi and tau, Jacobi function of 
psi plus tau would bring me up in the other direction which spans the parallelogram. And this function is not doubly periodic, so it's not really periodic along these two directions because we get this additional factor here. No, tau is the variable describing the geometry of the torus. Oh, yes. And you mean that psi can move, it can move over the real axis and move along here. It can move along tau and move in the other direction, right? And yes. And then there is another variable, the eta. Uh, so this is a function of, of two variables. And uh, each of those variables, psi and eta, they can be points in the elliptic fundamental domain. So, so far, so good. In the same way as in the expression 1 over, uh, say, z1 minus z2, or rather, x1 over x2 with real x, you have two points uh, which are in the interval between 0 and 1. Uh, you can now have two points which are in the fundamental domain uh, up here. If they are on the fundamental domain, they will be variables on the torus. Uh, and this, this is uh, precisely the, the idea behind it. You want a function which takes two arguments and which is somehow a generalization of, and let's forget about the inversion for a moment, of what is the distance on a torus. So we want a distance which respects the two periodicities of the torus. So the, uh, that, is, that is true. And you can see that the function is symmetric in uh, eta and psi. So it is enough to consider the periodicity with respect to the first variable, and then you can easily. I, I, so, no, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you asked that question, because that is something which is probably uh, a little too many variables and too many objects at the same time. No, thanks. Thank you. So now we have this uh, object omega. And I mentioned already right now in answering your question that we are seeking for a generalization of these differential forms. So we want a very natural differential form on a GMUS 1 surface. And indeed, uh, writing down the following formula, we'll get there. So we get alpha times omega of psi, eta, and tau. The psi can be expanded as n equals 0 to infinity f of n with respect to psi and tau, eta to, I'm sorry, here should, I should have an eta here eta to the n d psi. So if I expand this function omega with respect to the second argument, I'll get a power series with the set of coefficients. And these coefficients, they are precisely the objects I am after. So taking the d psi into account, these are the differential forms which will be the starting point for iterated integrals on the elliptic curve. And starting from those, I will also define uh, elliptic multiple zeta values right now. Uh, yeah. Before uh, erasing the blackboard, let me write down a couple of properties of these f's. The first one is that f of 0 is trivial. It's 1. And the second one is that f of 1 can again be represented as the Jacobi uh, function. So 
plus a piece which originates in the correction factor up here. So that's mz over m tau. And this function f1 is the only function which is uh, singular on the elliptic curve. It does have a pole at every lattice point. So this is the function which contains the um, physics information at the very end. So this is the function when we integrate over, we are getting the same trouble we had for the usual multiple zeta values. That is the function where we will have to think about uh, regulating the corresponding integrals. And then there is uh, F2 and so on. And these functions, they are non-singular on the elliptic curve. So what is the reason we're not getting one differential we want to iteratively uh, integrate over, but we are getting many. The uh, reason is the double periodic structure of the elliptic curve again. So already in this correction factor, which is now up there, you uh, could see that the correction is an exponential. And if you expand the exponential, say in that case in a variable eta, you can see that for each power of eta, you need to correct further. So it's an infinite number of corrections which at each expansion order ensures the double periodicity. And with the differentials, it is, and this is mathematically not very precise, but it's the correct explanation, it is the same thing. Uh, you cannot preserve the doubly periodic structure with integrating over these functions f1 exclusively, but you need, in order to get valid objects on the elliptic curve, all the other functions f, f2, f3, and so on, in order to preserve uh, actually homotopy invariant integrals on the elliptic curves. So you want to preserve good properties and you need all these correcting F2, F3, and so on. And they appear very naturally in the Fe identity as I will show right now. So let's make a table. Let's write genus zero here, and let's write genus one here, and compare the structures we had. For here, it was dt over t minus a1. That was the only differential we needed to iteratively integrate over. Here, it is f1 of t minus a1 tau dt, which we want to integrate over. And then we have others, f2 to, yeah, and, and more, which we need for consistency. Secondly, for this type of integrals, and Eric has uh, made a comment about that when he said, oh, we are asking for a basis in the cohomology of these integrals this morning. We have the partial fraction identity. So we can write 1 over t minus a times t minus b is 1 over t minus a, a minus b plus 1 over t minus b b minus a. The analog here you will get, if you take the phi identity, you promote the phi identity to the 
function omega. So instead of f's, you will have omegas there, and it is, you can write it, the phi identity. As it will have exactly the same form as this. And then you can take an expansion with respect to eta and write down what the phi identity implies for the small functions f. So I take the phi identity and I consider the omegas, which are in the phi identity, as a uh, generating series for the lowercase f's. And then I can write down what the phi identity implies for each uh, expansion order. And if I do so, then I'll get a rather complicated expression, which for completeness I want to please note once. So one can show that f of n1 of t minus, say, x, f of n2 of t is minus minus 1 to the n1 f to the uh, fn1 plus n2 of x plus uh, sum j equal 0 to n2. And then we get a binomial coefficient n1 minus 1 minus uh, plus j over j times f of n2 minus j f of n1, wait, plus j. And this is of x. And this is of t minus x. And then there is another term, j equals 0 to n1. And here we get n2 minus 1 plus j over j f of n1 plus j of uh, x f of n2 plus j of t times minus 1 to the n1 plus j. So I hope I didn't mess up. It is a rather complicated thing, but what I want to get across is the fact that this type of identity is precisely the genus 1 analog for partial fraction. So uh, whenever you had an integral and you wanted an iterated integral and that you had two terms of this differential form, so say dt over t minus a and then another uh, 1 over t minus b here, you could par use partial fraction, which would make it inverse linear to t. And then we could use the uh, definition for the iterated integral and write it as an iterated integral. Because the a minus, minus b doesn't make a difference, but the 1 over t minus a is the term we want. That's exactly the same thing here. If we have something which is uh, has the same uh, argument or the same uh, and the same degree, uh, and we want to rewrite it in a way that we can apply the definition of an iterated integral, and I will define that in a minute, then one can use the phi identity. So in that respect, we had defined here the g of a1 to a r at variable z as integration from 0 to z dt1 over t1 minus a1 g with a shorter label a r evaluated at t1. That's exactly the objects Eric wrote down this morning. And at the same uh, way, we can define I will scroll down in a minute again. In the same way, we can define uh, iterated integrals on the elliptic curve. These will be called gamma. And now we need two arguments uh, at the same time. 
nr and ar at z because each of the differential forms we are integrating over has a weight, which is the thing in the parenthesis for the f, and a shift, a possible shift in the argument. So this is not at all surprising. The integral from 0 to z of f of n1 t1 minus a1 gamma of n2 to nr a2 to ar at t1 d t1. It's precisely the same, same structure. It's actually a very naive generalization. You integrate over a suitable differential, which is a little more complicated in the elliptic case, and you define these iterated integrals. So, so far for the comparison for the moment, now it is a piece of cake to write down what the properties of these uh, elliptic polylogarithms actually are. The pioneer who uh, invented them or who first uh, explored them, say, was André Levin. Uh, he wrote a paper, it's called An Analytic Theory of uh, Elliptic Polylogarithms, an uh, amazingly beautiful paper. Uh, closer for the physics community was a paper by uh, Francis Brown and André Levin, which is still very mathematical. But in this paper, uh, also relations to possible sum representations I will not talk about are uh, neatly explored for these elliptic.
define multiple zip tuple. So there's uh, nothing interesting actually about that. Uh, in the genus zero case, the multiple z tuple values showed up when you evaluated the gotcha of polylogarithms at z equals one. And that's exactly, precisely what we're going to do here. So if one defines that uh, omega a of n1 to nr is an iterated integral 0 less equal to z i less n equal to z i plus 1 less n equal to 1 f n1 of z1 d z1 to f of n r z r d z r and if you convert this way of writing the integral into the gamma language, this is gamma of nr down to n1, 0, 0. So we have no shifts here. So the lower line will be all zeros at evaluated at 1. Actually, down here, we don't need to have zeros. Any integer will do as well. What is the reason for that? The functions f in which these go in, uh, as arguments, as shifted arguments, they are doubly periodic in the same way as the uh, omega series is. That is, every integer which appears down here can be immediately written as a zero using this property of the functions. Now, I promised that I would explain, and that's probably the last thing I can do today, why I wrote a sub-index A here. You can, of course, guess this A is for A cycle. So I erased the fundamental domain picture. That's unfortunate. Uh, Let's have the fundamental domain again. And in the torus picture I drew at the very beginning when I tried to bridge between genus 0 and genus 1, I may have these two tori at the blackboard, one with the A cycle, which was basically the cutting line for cutting your breakfast donut, and the B cycle, which was the other cycle of the torus. And I would like to map the a cycle, and that's how I explained it, to the real axis of the B cycle here, to the line between 0 and tau. And if you now look at the integration domain, the way I defined it down here, I have cheated a little. So I have assumed that all these zi integration points are on the real line. I can do that because the definition of the elliptic polylogarithms in terms of the honest doubly periodic functions does not require to choose the integration path to be the real line. These are completely homotopy uh, safe definitions. I could choose whatever kind of line I want, so Z doesn't have to be real in, at all. Nevertheless, if I want a uh, particularly easy representation of the elliptic multiple zeta values, then it is very favorable to take this uh, definition to choose all the iterated integration points on the real line, which will lead to so-called acyclic elliptic multiple zeta values. And you can guess immediately that there is B-cycle elliptic multiple zeta values, and these e cycle elliptic multiple zeta values, they are just a different representation of the algebra of the elliptic multiple zeta values. They are horrendously more complicated than their a cycle cousins, so let us please stick to these 
uh, real line for this lecture, that will also make the differential forms a lot easier. So in this F1 up there, I wrote that uh, it is the ratio of the derivative of the Jacobi thinner function uh, and the function itself, plus this additional term which originated in the exponential corrective factor for the f in order to make it an omega. Now, as soon as we are on the real axis, that is, as soon as we are considering real z, the second term here will disappear. And the functions f2, f3, f4, they will have far more complicated additions which are all proportional to the imaginary part of z. So choosing something here on the real line is actually a very good idea, which made the treatment of these elliptic polynomials uh, a lot easier in the first place. So let's recapitulate for uh, a moment. In this lecture, I uh, started to explain the way of how to describe the geometry of the torus briefly. The punchline was that the tau is one parameter which explains uh, basically everything you need to know about the geometry of the torus. And then you defined a lot of functions which depend on this parameter tau, which I left simply there uh, and uh, left this as a parameter describing the geometry later. And then Starting from the question, what is a natural generalization of this dt over distance uh, differential form in genus zero? I developed this, uh, or I didn't develop it here. I wrote down the uh, conical function, which is the unique answer to this question, showed that it has almost doubly periodic uh, properties and that the differential forms we are after are the expansion coefficients of this quadratic series. And then everything else was a piece of cake. We could just define these iterative integrals exactly in the same way as we did at genus zero. And all the properties, shuffle, and the definition of the corresponding Zeta values was more or less straightforward. So this is the objects I hope I can talk about, about their properties and about some uh, other representation and their connection to some amplitudes of physics for the next time. Okay. Thank you. 
So before you wrote down the, the second half of the last backboard, when I just look at the left side, yes. and I would have thought that um, uh, comparing genus one, uh, genus zero to genus one, uh, the thing that labeled the zeta variance in the genus zero case were the A i's. So I would have thought that that would have carried over, but now you've showed us that they don't actually matter as long as they're natural numbers. So what actually labels the genus one um, zeta values are the n i's, which I would have thought to be just some additional tower of zeta values. So, so is my thinking wrong? Is this it, weird? It, or? it is fortunately wrong, okay. but it's a very good question. I, I, find it, I find it really a very good question. So when we define what zero means in terms of the torus, we just chose an arbitrary point on the torus and declared uh, this as the intersection point uh, of the two cycles and said, OK, we'll place the zero of our coordinate system here. But we could have chosen any other point. So if we uh, think about uh, what that means is, actually, for each of these integrations, we can think about an extra elliptic curve we are integrating over. And for each of those things, one can uh, choose where the zero is. So this is not very precise. But I think one can imagine that in each integration step, you could choose a different coordinate system. And it turns out that what you get by considering these shifted arguments here can be mapped uh, to the same uh, zeta values. So uh, you will get something which is a real function which can be linearly related to these uh, elliptic zeta values I defined. This is a very good problem. Yeah? Um, when you define the omega differential form, you destroy homogeneity with this uh, prefactor of the uh, yes, exactly. imaginary part. Is that somehow restored when we get the uh, elliptic polylogarithm because we want that to be an elliptic function, don't we? It depends on which, which polylogarithm you're actually looking at, but in general, no, it's not restored. So um, one has to very carefully think about what you need to ask for these differential forms in order to, first of all, so there is a, there is an analytic or homotic version of these maps. Uh, but more serious is the question: What happens with the? Uh, uh, what happens if you actually perform the integration for this form? Do you actually keep homomorphicity? Um, yes, you should better. Uh, but then you uh, need to think about that question with respect to the endpoint regularization. And the short answer is: It's a difficult thing. So one has to be very careful in order to show that you get. Uh, Elliptic polynomials which are holomorphic around, say, a certain uh, set. But it can be done. Yeah. Um, so in the end, these are numbers, right? At the end, they are functions of time. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks again for, for uh, making that, that clear. So the that, that is something I should, should do differently next time. So I should have been writing here that there is still a tau in the argument. I should have, at least I should have said it, that of course these tau's are in the f's all the time. And because it's so obvious, one actually suppresses the uh, tau in writing here. But yeah, I should have done it differently. So these elliptic multiple zeta values are not values at all. They are functions of tau. And we'll look at their so-called Q expansion, or let, yeah, let me call it Q expansion. It's an it's a expansion in Q, but up there, Q is defined as a function of tau. So it is uh, the power series behavior uh, in a variable which is related to the geometric uh, okay. Yes, so they are, they are functions. What about the monotropies of these elliptic entities? What do you mean, what about the monotropies? Is it a delay of monotropies when you walk around? You walk around in the tau plane? No, in the plane, in the No, otherwise I wouldn't know, because they, they are a function of tau only. What no, 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 not the uh, monotropies, the values for the multiple polyliters. The multiple polyliters. Yes, they definitely have a lot of ways, and they are not trivial, and you can play very similar games as you can play for the usual uh, polyamorphic. Mm -hmm. 
you can have generated functions, you can even try to write down what single value means and translate that into monotony conditions, but this is not really settled. This is a more difficult issue. Yeah.